This, this is SWBC this Mortgage's is Dallas Cowboys Crosstalk. Crosstalk. Check this out. Broadcasting live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. Brought to you by Blockchain.com. Make your crypto play today. The National Medal of Honor Museum. Join the mission at mohmuseum.org. Buffalo Wild Wings. If it's game day, Buffalo Wild Wings is the place to be. Altec Lansing. Just listen with Altec Lansing. Perfecting sound since 1927. And by SWBC Mortgage. Customized solutions to help you meet your personal and business goals. Visit SWBC.com. Now your hosts, Nate Newton and Bobby Belt. Week one of the 2024 NFL season has arrived, and we are live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. Welcome to Cowboys Crosstalk. I'm Bobby Belt from 105 Through the Fan. Tonight I've got my 105 Through the Fan teammate, Will Chambers, joining me. Uh, we're also joined, as always, by three-time Super Bowl champion and six-time Pro Bowler Nate Newton. And our Cowboys legend this evening is a Dallas native, an alum of Berkner High School in Richardson, wow. a Grambling State Tiger, four-time Pro Bowler, three-time NFL interceptions leader, and a Super Bowl champion. And should be Hall of Famer. Uh, should be Ring of Honor, Hall of Famer, all of that. Everson yeah. Walls. Everson. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Please for don't call me, him guys. Emerson. Please, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. You know, this is uh, – do, do, do you guys – are you all getting the – the normal excitement of the NFL season, uh, like now that it's it's just right upon us. I, every year I, I get that way where it's just you start feeling the, the nervous energy of just like, all right, football's fine. Especially here. like the one night, the, like the one sleep left, like you're just one day away. I, I don't feel that for this season. Really? Not for this season, no. Uh, this season kind of snuck up on me a little bit. Uh, I, I, I know a little bit about the team, but I think after last year, I kind of have a little hangover. <laughs> I really do. The, the playoffs have still got me. You know, Nate knows I'm a super Cowboy fan. I bleed the silver and blue. That's just how it goes. But I am more curious about this team than anything else because what I want from this team is something they haven't given me yet. And as we talk about it throughout, throughout the hour, I want to figure out if we have that team that I want, the one that can, that can travel well, the one that can run the ball, and the one that doesn't depend – on its offense to win every game. That's the kind of – that's where I'm at. I want to see if they can do that this year. Like a Star Trek kind of year, you know. They <laughs> off and voyage. I'm Captain Kirk going off and to, yeah, right. you know what I'm saying, the, the unknown. unknown. The yeah. unknown. Yeah, it certainly has you excited. That's what got us excited because the majority of us, we, we think we got a handle on this team, but we don't know. There's so many variables to this year. Uh, like last year, we knew who we were going into. Yes. We were excited. But this year, we don't know this team, not, not 100%. You, you know what I looked at today? Mm -hmm. And it kind of feeds off ever since what you said, because I, I saw a thing in The Athletic that it had surveyed 12,000 NFL fans. Okay. So we're talking like 350, 400 per team, if that's the way it went down, which we know wouldn't be for the it Cowboys. It wouldn't be even, right? <laughs> right. And it was a, a meter on optimism and pessimism. The Cowboys were 30th. In optimism, 80% of the Cowboys fans that were surveyed, and they were just offered up to do it. Like, it wasn't, you know, it's like, here, do you want to, like, how optimistic are you? How pessimistic? Yeah. 80% pessimism. I Only two that. teams worse on that, and I think off of last year. And it's interesting because we're coming off of three 12-win seasons, right? You know how many times a team that has won 12 games in a season three times in a row get to four? I think Nate's team was the last team to do it. For the Cowboys, yes. Yes. And yeah. they end up going to the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you know, it's a, I think I had this conversation with somebody the other day, the idea about the, the 12 wins. Uh, in fact, it was today. We were walking, uh, you know, the halls of the star, going down to the locker room uh, to, to talk to the players after practice. And, and somebody had said something like, man, you would think there would be a little more, <laughs> a little more optimism for a team that's won 12 games three right. years in a row. And, and I had said – you know, I, I, I think it just raises the expectations, though. It makes those falls that much harder. That's where it's right. like That's three right. straight 12-win seasons sets you up for, so why isn't it any different than when we were winning 10 and 6 and 12? Why is it ending the same to, to exact me, way? To me, the difference was last year, because of we, we solved a lot of contract situations. Yeah. 
uh, that we needed to tie up, and they, they tied it up so neatly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember the press conference from the coach, and he goes, uh, sees everything. You know, Carpe omnia. Carpe omnia. Sees everything. And I'm thinking to myself, yes, that, that means that this is the year. And they publicly said, we're all in last year. And that's what got me. I was all in with them last year. And even though I was blinded by certain things that I knew were right there, and they used to talk about them all the time, I went into that game and I went into the season, especially the second half of the season, thinking that we can actually win a playoff game with six defensive backs playing the entire game. I actually had myself believing that. I wasn't thinking about the Bills game. I wasn't thinking about the Dolphins game, which showed me that we could not do it. Right. I was all in because we were seizing everything, <laughs> and we didn't do it. And I, I, once I took the, the blinders off and realized there's no way we could have won that game with six defensive backs starting. It is no way we should have thought we could win that game unless our offense explodes. Uh, not implodes, but explodes for more points. And you, what you say is you can't have a defense depending on your offense. You just can't do it. I say it on the podcast all the time. I want a team that can depend on our defense to pull us out of every game. You know, Everson, you are a your, – your career path, your career trajectory – it is a real testament and symbol of, like, grit and, and fighting against the odds. Nate, same sort of way, fighting against, you know, being, you know, overlooked by, by the, the league and the system and everything that they do, and, and you guys overcoming that. And I remember last year when we were doing the show at the end of the year, Nate, you said that you thought the biggest problem on this team is you said they didn't have enough mean. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember that stuck out to me. We went to, we went to Super Bowl Radio Row. We got a chance to talk to Emmett. And I, I brought it up to Emmett. I said, hey, Nate had said this. What do you think? And he goes, yeah, there's no Kevin Gogan on this team. There there, there's go. no James Washington on this team. Yeah. Is that – do you think they've sufficiently potentially dressed or, or the anger that may have come out of that Green Bay loss, do you think they've sufficiently addressed heading into the season grit and that underdog determination and, and mean? That, that, that don't come from – they don't practice that way. You, you have to kind of practice that way. Up You're tempo. talking mentality. They yes. can't practice yes, that way anymore. But yeah, <laughs> uh, CBA, you know, man. <laughs> let, me, let me say this right here. Did, that's why I, I impress upon people. I like the inner squad scrimmages. The Rams yeah. came there, and believe me, they practiced that way. Mm -hmm. Not only the first time when the Rams showed up, we had to pick up our pace mm -hmm. to keep up with them. Mm -hmm. The second time they came there, they practiced that way. I'm looking on one field, and they knocking down our receivers. We patting their receivers mm -hmm. because coach, you know, say, hey, is there going to be no fighting? Well, they, evidently they didn't tell the Rams, you know, <laughs> it wasn't going to be no fighting because they was ready for that. And their tempo was up here. And we picked it up, and we matched it. I heard, but, that, I heard that they did match it. Yeah, that's right. that we matched it. Right. But you don't come into my house, that's, and I that's don't care where two. it's at. That's yeah. day two, Nate, yeah, you don't, right? You don't come into my house regardless of where you at. That is our field. Day one we is the Packers the game, right? Yeah, so we, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't uh, I call it the boom box theory. That's what the 49ers yeah. did a couple of years. Right. They came in with a big boom Debo, box, Debo and they the just gave box. that dude like $46 million, and he 85 years old, the left tackle. <laughs> Trent Williams. Yeah. See, that, that is something you have to be born with. That is something that you have to be down with. You know, the Ravens have always been that way. Ne they have never changed. They practice the same way everybody else. It's just the tempo of how you practice. And I thought we was practicing fast. When I first got out there, everything I did kicking back here, oh, man, the Cowboys are practicing fast. The Cowboys are practicing fast. Da, 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 da. But then I saw a difference fast when the Rams showed up. Uh -huh. what, who was, I, I would guess, for your teams ever since in the 80s, the 49ers kind of represented the – that's our, our, our mountain we got to scale. Nate, I, I think early on for the team, it I think you said giant. it was, was – it the Giants, Giants or Philly? It was the Giants. It so, was the Giants. So the Giants, wow. the way that you have to scale that. Yes. And I know we've had this talk before about San Francisco currently. There's been a lot of talk about the Green Bay loss, um, like repeatedly. And this is something I was kicking around with some people earlier. At what point do you risk something that should be a motivating factor like a team like that? becoming a distraction from just doing what you need to do. Like, like almost deifying somebody like 
the Giants or whatever. Do you need that motivating Coach, factor, or can it become Coach a distraction? Coach McCarthy is so crafty doing the record. He is so crafty uh, that he he get his guys to go. Yeah, he get his guys to go. The, the, the way you overcome this, fellas, and it's simple. When you play a team of equal or better talent, you have to win. I don't care if they take it serious or not. You have to win. When we play the Ravens, when we play Cleveland, when we play Detroit, when we play the 49ers again, wh- whoever we play that we know that can ball, we got to be like three and three and two, four and one. It can't be two and two and two, two and three. That means we haven't learned. You got to beat the teams with equal or better talent. That way, when you when you have a home game and Green Bay come in here again, they can't sneak up on you because your level of play is up here. Bill, uh, that's a Bill Parcell here, thing. Here, here's, here's what I'll say about yeah. that. What we have now, we are at a sense of urgency. Yes, we are. You don't you you could be mean. I think urgency. Yes. Uh, we're at the point now to where everyone's fed up. And when you look at how the coaches are, are, are working with this team, the mean person that we have right now, that would be Coach Zimmer. That's, that's the mean right there. I, I, they don't have I'd throw it. Jordan Lewis in there too maybe. But, oh, well, yeah. well, Jordan, but you know, who's going to listen to a TV? Right. I, no, who's I know. Listen I to a, they listen to linebackers. It, it, there's a lack they of, listen to Lima. They don't <laughs> listen to us. There's a lack of guys is really, <laughs> right. you know. But, but you ha- if, you, if it's from the top, then it can not trickle down. Mm-hmm. But Zimmer should be the guy that brings that in. Coach Quinn was amazing. He dealt with what he had to deal with. Zimmer has what he wants. He has what he wants. There's no excuses for this defense now not to come out and be a more solid defense and be able to go on the road and win against better teams, just as Nate was Isn't talking. that where Micah is supposed to be? Let, well, let, Mike, let, Micah's there. Micah's that guy, but there's not enough Micahs. you got to have someone that can spread that message. And the coach, if this comes from the top, talking about the defensive coordinator, if it comes from the top, I truly believe that this team will get the message from their coach, and it will sprinkle down. Let's, uh, let's when we come back on the other side of the break, talk a little bit more about that. Also get into uh, some of the Cowboys and Browns history, because I know it's hard for some people to believe in this day and age. That is a deep historic <laughs> rivalry, the Cowboys and the Browns, actually, if you go back through history. Uh, so we will talk about that next on the SWBC Cowboys Crosstalk.
back to SWBC Mortgage's Dallas Cowboys Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Broadcasting live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. At SWBC, customized solutions for individuals and businesses are just a click away. Visit SWBC.com to learn more and start your next adventure. We are live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco for the SWBC Cowboys Crosstalk. I'm Bobby Belt from 105 Through the Fan, joined by Will Chambers, also of 105 Through the Fan, three-time Super Bowl champ and six-time Pro Bowler Nate Newton. And our Cowboys legend this evening is former Cowboys corner, Super Bowl champ, and three-time interception leader, Everson Walls. Everson, thanks so much uh, for joining us. We were... We were talking a little bit. I, I, I want to get going towards a, uh, a discussion we were just having during the break about Nick Saban, somebody that you played for in, in Cleveland. Ever since. Real quick, though, I wanted to give you all a chance to kind of just finish up. Uh, Will, I know what you were just talking about there about uh, during the break about Miles Garrett and Micah Parsons and, and some of the, the mean questions. I, I think that in, uh, what Nate was talking about at the end of last year has been you know trying to define the symptom as to what exactly the issue has been to why there's been – 12 wins in a very good football team. A talented, very good team in the regular season that, for whatever reason, it folds like a lawn chair in the first game of the playoffs. And that mentality, I felt like from the outside looking in just in that Green Bay game, going like, it when it was early, it was evident that they were not there to play because we've seen this movie before. To me, CeeDee Lamb is pissed, and I'm like, that's what he's pissed about. Right. I don't know. I, CD hadn't told me anything, and I don't know that for sure. That was my feeling, and I think that alludes to a little bit of what we've been talking about as to what may be missing from this group. Uh, to me, if, and I remember that moment. To me, I thought it was not the time for you to isolate yourself. That's sure. What, that's sure, what sure. I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. I knew what he was mad at. Of course I knew he was mad at. Like, hey, man, let's not start this again. We've been through San Francisco, been through all that, losing big games. Probably was upset at the defense as well because of what we didn't have. We weren't going to stop anybody with that defense. But to me, if I'm C.D. Lamb, I'm calling Dak over myself. I don't need Dak following me. Mm -hmm. trying to get a word with me. I'm going to be waiting on him on the bench, and we're going to talk. And I'm going to tell CD, if this is my moment, we're not having this today, Dad. We're not having this today. All right? I'm with you. You my dude, but we're not having this today. That's not what I saw. That's not I saw something where, man, I'm not getting what I want. I know that's, that's his thing. That's what wide receivers do. If I get it, we win. Especially the young ones. The young ones. If I get it, we win. That's what they always think. And with C.D. Lamb, he's a guy that's that, that has that, he's that kind of catalyst. But you still have to go to your quarterback and talk to him, and you don't leave him isolated at this moment. That's just, that's just me. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, like I mentioned, this is actually a pretty historic rivalry that we have coming up this weekend between the, the Cowboys and the Browns. And, that sounds odd, I think, probably, especially to a lot of younger fans who don't necessarily remember the pre-merger days or who don't know about the pre-merger days. But, I mean, you talk about the first decade that the Cowboys were in existence, they didn't play a team more than the Cleveland Browns. The wow. Cleveland Browns, they played them 19 times in the first 10 years of their existence, including three games in the playoffs. They've played them. This will be the 14th game in the last 55 years between the Browns there, and the there's Cowboys. There's a fans. trivia question for everybody mm -hmm. out there. there. There you go. Here's they, – they've got uh, – they played a game uh, Sunday, November 24th, 1963, which is two days after uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, which players, Gil Brandt, I know, had done a lot with the History Channel talking about this, where he had said that, um, you know, they were they arrived to the hotel, the team hotel, and the bellhops turned their backs to the Cowboys players and wouldn't carry their luggage inside because they, like, held the Cowboys responsible, the city responsible. That's um, what a lot of people they, they don't still understand do. that are young. Yeah, no, yeah. Still no, there, there, do. There's yeah. a lot. Uh, 19, 1967, <laughs> right before the Ice Bowl, the Cowboys beat the Browns pretty bad. If the Browns go on and play that game, I mean, they've got a chance. They had four titles in the last 15 years at that point. Packers had the same kind of changes things. And then 1994 – a big game that <laughs> potentially changed the trajectory of, uh, you know, the, the NFL playoffs in 94 and maybe could have set up a, a four straight run. Um, you guys lose to the Browns in December. Uh, a, a tough play at the end where Jay Novacek slips Man, on wet turf a, yeah. uh, against Bill Belichick and Nick Saban and the, uh, the Cleveland Browns, but slips just short. 
lose that game, kind of lose driver's seat position over the 49ers for home field advantage. That's lost on the uh, goal line. Yeah, and that was uh, and they they end up going a few weeks later, have to go to San Francisco for the NFC title game. I know I've heard players say that they feel like if that's played here in at Texas Stadium, we feel like we win that game. Like, like if you've got the home field, that you you feel a little different, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I love that. I, I, you know, you lost, bro. <laughs> yeah, they, we got the, the Browns got your, had a heck got, of a defense that yeah, day. Yeah, you got beat. The Browns beat us, and and the, you got beat. You know, you well, it was beat. it was fortunate too because there was they, earlier about three minutes left in the game, y'all were down two, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Troy fumbles the center exchange with Stepnoski on right. fourth down. Cleveland recovers it. They kick a field goal, and then Kevin Williams ran it back to midfield. Right. And you guys were able to get down there, and then it's just something wet turf there at uh, Texas Stadium that Novacek slips on. But Forgive me, but didn't, didn't they play you guys also in uh, Texas Stadium? Yeah, yeah. We didn't take and they, they, yeah. that's when they stopped you on the one yard line. Yeah, yeah. that was that that was that no, game in '94. And that. then <laughs> we're trying to rehash no, no, this. No, it's no, just no, opening sorry, up some got, wounds for I'm Nate. Sorry, here. I, I, <laughs> yeah, man, stop. But it's a, it's, a, it's a very like I made it, not, only is it, not only is we we lose the game, but I'm getting pointed at. I like it with me. I blocked my man <laughs> on all the situations. It was a. Uh, it, it was. Uh, it, either way, it's a very it's a very historic rivalry. Uh, there's a lot. There's is. a lot. Of, there's a lot of significant. Hey, can we stuff. move on to the next? Yes, Saban exactly. Story. That's exactly what we're gonna get to. Nick Saban was on the sideline that day as well as Bill Belichick. Um, Everson, when you left here from Dallas, you went to New York, played yep. for Bill Belichick there oh. with the Giants. He goes to Cleveland. Uh, you you follow him over there where sure Nick did. Saban is the defensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know we were talking about this during the break. There was about a decade ago, Drake Kirkpatrick was coming out of Alabama. And he gave a statement at the combine where he said, somebody asked him about his back pedal, and he said, I've never pedaled once in my life. And they were like, what? How's that possible? How do you not back pedal? And that's kind of when Saban's uh, shuffle technique and coverage had, had kind of come into focus. Now, there is a story out there, and, and I'd love for you to, to speak on it and clarify or confirm anything. But there, there's a story out there that that shuffle technique came from Saban working with you in Cleveland, that it was – he, he came up with that technique and decided that it was a good one that they could incorporate for you. True or false? True, okay, because we played cover two most of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Belichick loves that cover two. I played it in New York. It helped extend my career. Came to Cleveland, and Belichick is just like Nick Saban. They, they were, he was a product of him. Now, the words that he said afterwards were not correct, which is, Everson Walls can't backpedal. <laughs> <laughs> how did That's you, make, how did you make it 12 years before that, Everson? <laughs> <laughs> For, I, I, heard, I saw that, and that's the only snippet that I saw. I had no idea that it was about a particular player. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the only snippet I saw. Everson Walls couldn't backpedal. I believe he said to save his life. Mm. <laughs> I think he said it's something like strong, that. strong, Nick. <laughs> and wow. so I just took offense to that yeah. o- only because uh, what Nick saw was a guy that I was a vic- not a victim. I was a product of the system that I had started to adopt. Yeah. Okay? I had to ad- adapt to that system because that's what they played, and I did it very well. So the technique that he's talking about, yes, that technique was something that I did all the time, but it was only out of necessity because of the particular defense we played. When I was here in Dallas, we couldn't do that. I had to backpedal. And people just don't get it. I try to explain to them about the yeah. flex defense and right. how it works and how you got to read the flow of the back. No one – they just go blank whenever I try to talk about it. We have to read the backfield. We have to read the flow of the backfield in the flex defense. Cornerbacks don't do that on any other team but the Cowboys. You're looking in the backfield while you're supposed to be playing defensive back. That's not how you play it. So what we had to do, key the backs, which adjusted us from playing zone to man. That's right. So I had to backpedal from a zone position off the man to an inside position during the flow of the game, during the flow of the play. So you have to backpedal like that. I couldn't survive without my backpedal uh, with the, the lack of speed that I had. My backpedal kept me in position so that the, the wide receivers wouldn't make me turn so that I could compromise myself. My backpedal kept, kept the leverage that I always had as a player especially here in Dallas, and that's how I was able to shut guys down from coming inside and deep 
across the field. What I, was the I, difference in the shuffle then? What the move? The shuffle. A, the shuffle is closer to the. You're closer to the wide receiver because you're playing cover two, so you're lined up within five yards off the receiver. So in order for you to play cover two and read the backfield, there has to be a shuffle to get you in position. You're not going to shuffle from five yards off of a receiver and shuffle inside and think you're not going to get passed up. Mm -hmm. They're going to close that gap on you so fast. So you can't shuffle and play man-to-man. -man. You have to shuffle and play zone. You can't shuffle and play man-to-man -man mm -hmm. unless you have somebody over the top. You know, Everson, you, we, we mentioned there working with Nick Saban, working with Bill Belichick. I, I don't know that we would be able to have somebody on this show who's – were or played for more legendary lineup of coaches in their career than than Everson Walls, all the way back to Eddie Robinson, and then you you've got Tom Landry and Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, Nick Saban. Was there anything that you found, you know, whenever people are trying to identify what makes a coach great? I think was there anything you found among those coaches that you played for all those greats where you said this is a unifying factor about all of them? They are a slave to their system. They know their system back and forth. And their, their philosophy to you is you listen to what I say and play within the system and it will work. That's what you get from every coach. The flex defense, most guys hated the flex defense, but we did a damn good job with it. Uh, we didn't win any, any Super Bowls in 1980, but in 1970s before it was caught up with, that flex defense, when everyone did their job, Jim Brown – couldn't, couldn't run it for as many yards. Running backs, all of a sudden, they're shut down. The secondary, yes, you're going to take your hits, but if you just hang in there, then you're going to make the plays in the secondary as well. Ask Mel Renfro. Ask Herb Adderley. Ask Everson Wall. Ask Michael Downs. Ask Dennis Thurman. Okay? We, if you play within the system, just listen to me and play within my system, it will work. But we all have to be on the same page. The same with Bill Parcells and the same with Belichick. Nate. One word, discipline. They didn't – no, if you didn't, if you wasn't disciplined, you didn't play. I mean, you I, – when I first got here, Randy, Randy White had the green light more than any player I knew, but even he was subject to the wrath of Landry. That's right. I mean, I saw him knock a running back – almost silly in the backfield for a five-yard loss. Randy. He got there the wrong way. You did not step <laughs> such and such. I, I'm like, who I'm the sitting wrong there way. saying, this dude just always <laughs> not. He said, Randy, inside step, step, inside step, read out with the guard. Randy from the inside, that. from yeah, the inside. Yeah, yeah. You let them hook you. Randy, yeah. saw, <laughs> Randy saw that dude. He took his step and <laughs> Ready, like okay, coach. Well, the, the flex is the flex is made for a particular player right. to make the play, and yes. that is the middle linebacker. That's what the flex is for. It's for Bob Brunick. It's for Eugene Lockhart. That's what the flex is for. If you make the play, they're going to see that. And if yeah. you make the play as a defensive lineman, you're going to be out of position the next time. Five plays later, Randy gets the sack. Randy. If you would have stayed, <laughs> I said to myself, somebody here ain't right. But this is a legendary coach, so. Yeah. Boy, and, it's and, a and, different Randy, and Randy did listen every once in a while. Well, yeah, it's yeah, a did. different, mm -hmm. very different NFL now uh, from how it's coached, from what you guys just described. We all can see how different the, the players are and the way the game has evolved, but the coaching aspect of it as well. And I think that's what no, we saw hasn't. Bill Belichick. No, it hasn't. Hmm. Talk to him. Look at all the four t the teams that's winning every year. They're disciplined, bro. You look at the 49ers. They, they, they ain't about that. Them four down linemen are always in their gap. No, I'm not talking about yeah. discipline. I'm talking about beholden to a system without changing. No. Look at the 49ers. Mm -hmm. Look at Detroit. Look at the Ravens. Uh, who else? Uh, it's one other team. Look at the Steelers. They've been running three, four. How long? Mm -hmm. They, they. Mike, tell them to tell you, son. This is how we do it here. Mm -hmm. See, it's still the same. Th why do you think we brought in Zim? Why do you think we we could have got some young hot shot? Why but, do you but think don't they you brought think in that Zim? Zim uh, because I heard Zim talking earlier this year 
or in uh, training camp about how even he is adapting to the players that he has on his team because he, he was is. asked about Micah. But, uh, but I, the and, discipline still has to be there. No, no, no. I, discipline okay. is okay. definitely, okay. Le, yeah. Let's Make no on. mistake about right, it. We're done with this. Yeah. But it, it's about systems. I, and really what I was thinking about as you guys were talking was Belichick because Bill Belichick went from being the greatest coach in the history of professional football, at least with Super Bowls, to getting one interview once he left New England. Mm -hmm. And I wondered about that, about being, like you were saying, a slave to their system. And that was really. Ran out of players, man. That, well, that's what I was going to say. He ran out of players. His system that's, was good, yeah. but he had a hell he of a players, players when they were winning the championship. He yeah. ran out of players, their defense, bro. That's on him, though. Too. Yeah, their yeah. defense, well, that, it was a heck of a defense. If you look at the, mm -hmm. the, and blame the Tom Brady. that defense. And right. blame Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> Like Kansas City. When this kid leaves Kansas City, everybody going to think Andy Reid can't coach. Andy Reid can coach. But that boy gone. You know, when we, we talk about, uh, you know, ever so the, the changes that may go into a Mike Zimmer defense compared to a Dan Quinn one, I heard, um, I heard Mike give a, an interview this offseason to Ed Werder where he had, you know, asked me, said, what, what do you expect will be different or, or how might things be a little bit different? He said, look, I think that, you know, if you're used to a lot of the turnovers that have been there right now, I, I think you're probably going to see less of that. Like, like we're going to be more about negative plays and trying to get to the quarterback and, and doing some of that stuff. Less about, you know, trying to take the ball away, flip field position, do, do things like that. Um, you know, you look at some of the other changes that are, he had said, uh, you know, in a, a non-critical way about Dan Quinn, he said, when I watched the tape back of the Cowboys last year, he said, I think too often – there was contentment to say, well, they're just taking Micah away today. If they're going to take Micah away, let's try and take advantage of some of the easier matchups that we have now. And, and he said, I, I think there's got to be a greater emphasis on us adjusting and trying to free Micah up throughout the game if they're doing something to that. And, and Micah today talked about how he's going to be all over the formation. He said there are personnel packages in the game plan this week that they may or may not get to where he said he essentially is – in the nickel he's in the you know he's playing safety he's playing linebacker he said he's playing a two eye he's playing you know four eye he's going to be playing all over the place doing all these different things is there given how much that Zimmer clearly wants to do in terms of that's kind of reactionary a little bit schematically different on the fly things like that what are the risks or the concerns about you know guys who are, are not necessarily scheme disciplined and the guys who, who are, you know, you potentially are going to have bigger busts by not having the guys who are, are, you know, as good of students potentially in the classroom during the week. Well, that's where you have guys like Demarcus Lawrence and Michael Parsons have to come through. I look at Michael Parsons as a guy that I, I haven't seen formation recognition from him yet. I haven't seen him be disciplined enough to really make those plays the way Miles Garrett has made it for the, the Browns. Similar numbers, of course. You know, but there are some games where Michael Parsons was just, just outmatched the other person. There are times in the playoffs and big games where we need Michael to be a little bit more uh, schematic. We need him to be a little bit more disciplined. Don't go down for the RPO when you got no one setting the edge. Yeah. Things of that nature. We need him to stop those plays. I don't want him to be a superstar. I want him to be that solid player that we have on that end that's like a and, – and Nate know what I'm talking about – like a Carl Banks. He wants, to yeah. be, he wants to be LT. Sometimes we need Carl Banks, yeah. a guy that's smart. He's right there. He, yeah. he knows exactly what's going on. He anticipates what the play is by formation, as you just said. That's the kind of Michael Parsons I want. There are times when you have to – you don't pin your ears back. There are times when you have to be a little bit more disciplined. And a guy like Michael Parsons, with the impact that he can make, if he were to play a little bit more disciplined as DeMarcus Lawrence does, then you're looking at a really solid defense on both sides. I remember Micah as a rookie, there was that I, – I refer back to this a lot. Um, but Micah as a rookie was on Hard Knocks, and they have him mic'd up for the Hall of Fame game. And – He's really eager. He wants to get out there. He missed a whole year of football due to COVID, and, he, and he, he got a little bit of a taste of it. And he wanted to go back out there, and he's talking to Leighton Vanderess on the side. And he goes, I just want to go out there and make a play. And Leighton goes, yeah, but you got to know what it, which is your play to make. And, and a lot I of people at the that. time, mm -hmm. I think, who, who don't have an understanding of that, 
felt like, oh, look, Leighton doesn't have the same motor or intensity that Mike has. It's like, no, Leighton's trying to communicate to you that everybody has responsibilities on a given play. Mm -hmm. and, and if you aren't doing your job, it's all going to fall apart. Like you were talking about where, you know, if guys are not doing their jobs within the scheme, it can all fall apart. So I guess, Nate, uh, Everson, both of y'all talk about on both sides of the ball the importance of doing what your job is and why freelance is so dangerous in a system. The the, and he said, "Be Carl Banks, be Lawrence Taylor, because I played against Lawrence <laughs> and Leonard Marshall." And I when, admit and, that and, in and, spots, and, and, no, in, in spots. spots. Yeah. <laughs> but we had a block where the tackle come down on on the guy over me, and I loop around, and either depending on what Lawrence doing, I can hook him, or I can kick him out and get it back a, a two way go because we blocking down Washington. And trying to wash in, in Leonard Marshall, which was almost impossible. So when I come out to Lawrence, Lawrence like, uh-uh, you ain't get to the outside of me. Now, that ain't happening. I'm setting his edge because yeah. I'm going to give uh, Harry Carsons and Banks and all these guys a chance to run, to run, to slam in the Emmett. Well, you know, this you, know who, you know who got him this one like that? Who that? Bill Belichick. Yeah. Bill yeah, Belichick. And, and I'm telling you, and then your boy would get up, go to the other side of same thing. He knew every position he played, he understood what was happening due to the percentages of that backfield. You know, strength over here, uh, slot over here. They knew, and they would be calling it out, just talking in the game. And me and Everson is on the same page because we, we old school. I've never said nothing bad about Michael Parsons, but I've always said this. If this kid ever get disciplined and really care about the game of football, and become a student, who would stop him then? He, he had a point today with his media availability where he said that Mike Zimmer's kind of said something similar to him recently, that Mike Zimmer told him, listen, if you will just focus down on these little things, these yeah. little technique things, there's, there's nobody who can stop you. You, you. I mean, you're talking about, you know, 20-plus sacks every year if, if he's that. It's honestly, it, it's – And once again, tackles for losses. Brother. Those are good too. Yeah, tackles for negative losses, plays. man. Negative <laughs> plays. <laughs> when 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 these reporters are, 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 are guys that announcers, whoever do the voting, mm -hmm. they 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 like okay, Michael got fourteen sacks, but does he have seventeen hits for losses? That's right. Does right. he have four four fumbles? Which is fumbles? something Miles Do he have a, a fumble recovery? How many times, you know, and Mike is good at this, hitting the quarterback, helping him get an in uh, interception. Mm -hmm. When you go to mm -hmm. adding that up, hands down, this kid, Miles Garrett, does it. That's now, it. What, I, I, what I like to do, what, did, what Micah did, he lost weight. He lost weight. Now he looked, he's moving he looked at it Denver today. City. Yeah. He looked it today. Yeah. He, he looks thin. And that's I don't great. Want him too thin. He's got to take on a few lines. He's well, got to take on some Nate Newton's coming around. But the thing about there. it, not, <laughs> Zim is going to hide him enough that he don't have to worry about that. And later in the season, he will be more effective. Every, you can tell around by week 12, 13, things get shady for him. You know, you see him over there with his lip <laughs> eyes. Come on, man. They're, they're holding him too yeah, much. Right? Yeah, because <laughs> they're holding they him all the time. Hold you now. <laughs> well, and, and look, this is not as deep uh, per position as it's been the last few years. So yes. it's going to be even more important, uh, you know, maybe with him being thinner that it, it – it will help him, uh, you know, cardio. I don't know. That'll I mean, make him realize he can't run But now. it's about understanding, like what you guys, what you were saying, Everson, that you need him to be able to do a number of different things outside of just being the super beast, run after, you know, rush the yeah. passer guy, because it's not the same defense personnel wise that we've seen. That's the better thing about it. He has a little bit more girth behind him now. You've got linebackers now. Mm -hmm. we, when he was turning things in last year, you had Bell waiting on a guy. You had uh, uh, Jordan Lewis waiting on a lineman to come up in there and blow him out of the hole. Okay, I, you I, understand? When, they, when, 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 when <laughs> Coach Quinn, Coach Quinn, because Bell is from Florida and m when Coach Quinn came to me and said, Nate, we got us a linebacker. I said, who, Coach, who? He said, you didn't see him in there? I saw, I saw Bell playing dime. Yeah. No, that wasn't dime. That, that's our linebacker. <laughs> I said, see, okay, Coach. I said, okay, Coach. 
<laughs> and I yeah, walked he was away. Excited. He was and excited. I, I remember I said, I said, boy, this ain't going to last. This ain't going to work. <laughs> and so you have Parsons out there with guys. The linebackers are smaller than he is. Yes. That's yeah. a, that was a linebacker, smaller than he is. Then I think he had a Kwame was back there as yeah. well. That's 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 mm. that's lunch meat for guys yeah. like Nate, man. Wow. They're pulling around there. That's why you have running backs running all through us at the end of the season. We hopefully, just personnel-wise, should be able to mi uh, 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 minimize that. And if when Joseph, you have that kind of minimization, then now you've got if Joseph and Jordan Michael can Parsons play. can feel a little bit more comfortable about not having to make every play. Now maybe he won't dip in too much because he thinks they run up the middle too many times on us. Maybe he would have the ability to discipline himself, let his boys make the play because they've been making it all night. And, and maybe also not be as predictable. Well, we were definitely predictable with six defensive backs. You could, you could be double teamed if you know where he's going to be or what right. he's going to do. Right. We got Osa. You, we got Joseph Lindell, Linville, and, and Jordan Phillips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's – That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's I, good stuff. I, I'm curious from both y'all's perspectives, for a perspective, one from a guy who, who would have played in the defense. Nate, from your perspective of the guy who is, who's watching it on the other side, Dan Quinn and Mike Zimmer, two very different philosophies pre-snap. So pre-snap, Dan Quinn says, static. I'm going to show you a static look. You're going to you you are going to see what you're going to see, and we're about execution, and that's going to be our big focus here. Mike Zimmer is a lot of dummy IDs and fake calls and showing blitzes and then dropping out. There was a, a clip that was going around this summer of the way they they took Julio out of a game at one point, which is they have a a guy right up on Julio, and then at the snap of the ball books it to center field and, and just has to hightail and they completely switch off. So doing a lot of different disguises and stuff, obviously more ripe for issues in terms of communication problems and, and busts in that sense. But uh, Everson first and then Nate, the, the benefit of those two things, what are the benefits of playing a static look? Like this is what we're doing. Everybody knows what we're doing. And then some of the more complexities of showing stuff pre-snap that then is different once the ball is snapped. If you look at the Tom Landry uh, system, uh, the flex defense itself, they would do a little bit of shifting. Uh, they would try and, and, and confuse the offensive lineman up front. Linebackers would make calls in the back. In our secondary, we had to show the umbrella look, even though they always knew we were going to back out into the cover three that I just tried to spoke of earlier. So all that movement was good for us, but by the time the end of the game, you, you know, you can't be doing too much disguising. They've already figured you out. Right. Okay, so you can do all that all you want. Eventually, the play just they, – they're going to know what you're in. There's only so many defensive calls you can make. So, eventually, they're going to get that. So, you still have to be disciplined in making the play. Go back – go for, fast forward to New York Giants. You know we're in cover two. And we ain't trying to hide nothing. You know LT's over there. Carl Banks over here. Pepper Johnson. Linda Marshall. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's more Zim. What are you going to do? <laughs> Zim is not going to do a lot with his defensive line. He'll do it with his linebackers and his corners. Yeah, show a He's lot of He's not going to do and a yeah. lot with his D line. You know where they're going to be. Coach Quinn, and I say this for all, I love Coach Quinn. We had a great relationship. But I, if I have anything to say to Coach Quinn, do not trust your players until they have proven repeatedly that they're disciplined. He trusted from Michael Parson on down, if you see something, go get it. That is the that is the heart killer to busting your defense. Because all the guy had to walk back and say, hey man, I saw that one back coach, and you know they would have had trips to the other side, man. <laughs> oh, I took that thing. Yeah, but they reversed it back the other way or they mm -hmm. ran a trap back the other way. And you got and you you gave them a hole. Discipline. It's all defenses Offenses, you can trip up a little bit, but defense-wise, when you trip out there, it's a 70-yard touchdown. All right, somebody getting beat deep. Yep. Uh, you know, the chains continue to move. You, you can't you – no, know, bro, discipline. Yeah, and, and I, I kind of wonder from Quinn's perspective, like when you talk about you've got a defensive back playing linebacker last year or you've had communication issues in the past, do you think it's possible Quinn just looked at it and said – hey, given the communication issues that we're having with these guys, we have to be static. We have to give a certain look, and, and like because I can't risk busts like that. I've said it more than once. 
personnel. They were too light in the butt. They were too light yeah. in the butt. They, they weren't going to stop and anybody you, like that. And I'm you, just telling you guys. The, the difference is now you've got linebackers, true linebackers. And to me, that makes all the difference in the world. They were getting blocked all the way downfield. And our nose guard, besides Hanks, all we had was Hanks. Osa was our penetrator. Yeah, three technique. H H Hanks is the guy that was trying to hold in there. He would get. He would sometime get his two guys, but then we went with the other guys. They never held it up, so Bell did not stand a chance. <laughs> every, every time he looked up, his guy his face. face man. <laughs> Can you imagine? After the, I, I walk up to you and say, "Hey, Bobby, you on my podcast, Bobby? We love you, baby. I'm glad you're here." Okay, what would you? What did y'all see that made y'all think? Yeah. Well, we just looked at you and ran right at you. Come on, I was gonna say uh, maybe yeah. on, I'm I was the better there. example of that. Come like, on, Will, you gotta pick up Nate. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, really? What, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. That's that. That was a lack of discipline. You did not give Bell a chance because the offensive line, the, the quarterback was in the huddle, and I'm gonna say 34 buck, 34 buck, 34 buck, 30. Check with me, 34 buck, 34, 35 buck. That's 35 to your left, 34 to your right. Check with me on the linebacker. On two. They walk up to the line. They go number, <laughs> they go, they go, they go bail. It's 34. <laughs> hey, ready, ready. <laughs> yeah. That's blue 34, it blue 34. And, and then you got to, and then you got to worry about somebody shooting the gap. That opens it up even wider. Yeah. Hey, go bail, like, wow, I'm stripped naked yeah. right up in the middle. <laughs> so we've got this, uh, we've got this game against the Browns this week. And Two of the areas are that, that are, I think, of, of interest or concern or, or focus are, are two areas where you guys probably are uniquely equipped to give some advice. Um, so you've got on the offensive side of the ball, Cooper Beebe, Tyler Guyton making their first starts. Guyton specifically going across from Miles Garrett. I'm sure they'll try to chip as much as they can. You obviously can't do that 100% of the time. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Deron Bland goes down. You've got Kalen Carson now. Big assignment right out of the gate. These are three good receivers for the Browns. Jerry Judy, Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore. That's, and you know, the tight end. Any, yeah, and any, anybody mm -hmm. who they want to match up on Carson, their fifth-round pick out of Wake Forest this year, they, they can probably find that matchup. So I'll start with you, Everson. If you got a chance to sit down with Kalen Carson this week, what would kind of be your, your words to him heading into this game of just, like, preparing for that first big moment against a really tough challenge? Well, Technique-wise, I would uh, tell him the same thing I tell the kids that I coach in these little camps around the country. This is going to be a, 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 a not a checkers match. It's going to be a chess match. I mean, you're going to be playing against a guy for 60 minutes, and he's going to show you everything he's got, and he's going to set you up as well. You're talking about Amari Cooper, one of the better wide receivers in route this game. Runner. In this game. All three really good route runners, but especially mm -hmm. Cooper. <laughs> Cooper, they, they did so much. With so, so sudden, and you got you've got two. He, he played with two different quarterbacks last year, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Maybe three. Still had his best and year he in Cleveland. Still had his best year in Cleveland. I mean, that's just a professional. With a guy like that, you have to don't you you cannot let him get comfortable. Number one, I would be on in his face the entire time, but understanding that my responsibilities are still the same. I still can't get beat inside. I still can't get beat deep. I'm faster than this guy. I can't get beat deep. I'm quicker than him. I can't let him inside. There are certain routes, uh, minimal routes, that you're going to have to give up. There are certain times he's going to move the chain on you. That's okay because this is not just a sprint. This is a marathon. And, at the end of the, and when it's all said and done, you're going to have to figure this guy out know what he's got to do, but also be the player that you are. Don't let him compromise your uh, responsibilities, your technique, and your confidence in yourself. Because there are certain things that I'm good at, and I'm, I'm talking about the cornerback. There are certain things that I'm good at. Whatever you're good at, you better be good at that. But also have in mind what your responsibility is as you go up against these great wide receivers. And that's, that's schematic. That's schematic. 72 yeah. receptions, 1,200 yards. Five TDs, seventeen point four yard average. So he, when he gets you, he gets you. There is no, there is no point waste. four yard average. There yeah. is, there is no wasted movement on his routes. No. Let, let me ask you this, uh, and Nate, your perspective too, because and, and this is all on paper, 
uh, not just because of personnel, because this is game one. It's not Nick Chubb, it's, it's Jerome Ford. Uh, both your tackles, <clears throat> excuse me, for Cleveland are on the injured list, or at least practice list. We don't know if they're going to play or not. Both of them were limited today, by the way. Okay. So it would appear that the running game would not be the strongest element of Cleveland's offense. As a defense, how much does that help you, or how much is that just smoke and mirrors? That's smoke and mirrors. Stefanski averages 30 rushes a game. He don't care who the running back is. He know how important that is to his play-action pass. You got to keep him he, honest. He, he gonna, him he's going to – we don't know who Deshaun is. You can't tell me right now who Deshaun Watson is. We knew what he was in Houston. Yep. And we knew what he was two or three uh, years ago. Yep. But we don't know today. He's going to run that rock. No matter who's back there, this man going to run that rock 30 times. Mm -hmm. So you, you can forget that. I mean, and our history tells him what? You better run the rock because yeah. the Cowboys have not stopped anybody yet. So, And to me, the most dangerous person when you have a good running game is the tight end. Yes, sir. And their tight end, if I'm not mistaken, made the Pro Bowl. David, David Njoku. Njoku. Yeah. He is How you pronounce that last name? Njoku. 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 Man, he, he put the joke call, on you. Hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, call him Black Panther. Yeah. Just call yeah. him Black Panther. Yeah. That's, I mean, That's he looks it. Panther. He fits that role. He's tough, He's man. a big, he's big dude. Strong. He's, he's a stud. I'm telling you. He's him. a stud. The, the, the thing, I, I, I like this game because there's so many questions has to be answered on both sides of the ball for them. Incorporating Jerry Judy and all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. Jerry Judy. Well, man. I mean, come, on, bro. This is this is this, this is a, a great nice matchup. game. This, this is, is a, a nice great matchup. A ni I wish great we was matchup. having it here. I wish he was at home. Though. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I yeah. mean, and this will be something where, you know, I, I think the some of the numbers that we've seen out there, like the projections out in Vegas and stuff like that, yeah. very low scoring game. Yes. I expect kind of a dog fight yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I, the, the big thing people are talking about this week, though, is the Guyton versus Garrett thing. Like, how vulnerable are they there? Nate, similar question to, like, what I was asking Everson a minute ago. If you got a chance to just kind of sit down, get in the ear of Tyler Guyton as he's preparing for this, what would you tell him? Technique. Technique. And, we, and, and finish. When you play a great player, one thing I never did is and I'm, I never relaxed because a great player can hurt you at any moment. He can be going three-quarter speed, and you can be wide open, and he can still get you because he's going to understand the formations. He's going he gonna, to he, he gonna, he gonna be setting you up. Everything that Everson said as a corner, that is the same thing for a left tackle, the very same thing. Yeah, like, you it's one-on-one. On one. Yeah, it's one-on-one. On one. One on one. So you got to be technique sound, <laughs> and when you get a chance to finish a guy, finish him. When you get a chance to put him on his back, go on and finish him, but just get on up and go on back to the huddle because the next play is coming. And a great player, they know they're going to lose a few. But it's the setup. It's the setup. I'm going to take him upfield. I'm going to take him upfield. And now we're in the gritty part of the game. We up by three. We driving. It's in the middle of the field. I'm going to take him upfield four mm -hmm. times straight. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom. I'm going to hit uh -huh. you back inside. Yeah. Now can you be smart enough to realize to set your behind down and shuffle back inside? So, yeah. To me, it de yeah. de especially it depends on the play that you have called yes, offensively. Sir. There are certain things you cannot let happen. Just like I said when I coach the kids. Guys, when you, when you hear a call, there are certain things in your mind that I say first you go through. These are things I cannot let happen as I come out of the huddle. I cannot get beat here. I cannot get beat there based on this call. Offensively the same mm -hmm. way. Yes. If, you, if you're going to have a draw play or whatever and you're going against. You can't beat me on the inside. You, you can't go. let you go there inside you go. of me. There you go. You know, certain things, certain cover plays, two. you cannot you, let it happen. Cover two, you forcing out, right? If, if he goes out, you take him. You take him. You but take if he him. goes inside. You, you got to go inside and drop with right. him. You got to let him go. It's just certain things you got to know. You can't let the wheel out get you. Yeah. You, you, it's, it's just certain things you got to know. We got just about two and a half minutes left. So uh, let's, let's run through real quick some just projections, some predictions for this game. Uh, Will, we'll start with you. Uh, Cowboys, Browns this weekend. What are you expecting? I mean, I expect the Cowboys to to win the game. Coming out of training camp, everything that I've heard <laughs> is that they the Browns have gotten their beat up a little bit, and on the offensive line. And you're going to tell me that Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence and that defensive line going up against uh, a very 
shaky. We don't know Deshaun. You're mm-hmm. right. But mm-hmm. what we what we do know is that he ain't coming out like C.J. Stroud. He ain't coming out <laughs> like Patrick Mahomes. If he does, it'd be the shock of the year so far. That I expect the Cowboys to be able to control there. And you can't win if you can't score. And so with Cowboys, uh, I, I like them there. Uh, I, I like Cowboys as well. Uh, one thing you always have to – there's always this X factor. The crowd's going to be behind them because the Cowboys are in town. I don't mm-hmm. care what you say about optimism – uh, pessimism, that, 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 or wherever you go, wherever, wherever you go, they are going to be fired up to play the Dallas Cowboys, mm-hmm. and that's just the way it is. So you have to expect that team to play you like they always play us, as if it's their Super Bowl. It's they're playing the '90s Bulls in perpetuity <laughs> from, from now on. Yeah. And so what? So with me, I look at the Cowboys offensively. Uh, I look at the guys that we still have. I think we're I think we're in pretty good shape with our offense. I think mm-hmm. our personnel is there. I think we can win this game. I'm looking at winning by ten points. Nate, you know where I'm going, so don't even worry about it, baby. <laughs> yeah. don't even what worry would you like it. to see then? What would I would what, like what, to what see the maturity that would be? of our of our young guys, the tackle mm-hmm. uh, in, in the center. They need to hurry up and develop. Mm. That you you cannot waste time. These first six games does not does not allow us to waste time. You start by beating Cleveland because they have a bunch of question marks. Get settled down. Get going. I tell you what, they run the football. If I was to ask for anything to happen, the Cowboys run the football, which would be a big surprise to me, run it like very well, I'd be like, oh, it'll look different. Yeah, that's something that I, I think the Cowboys are, are going to be determined to do this year. As much as there's been questions about the run game, I think they still feel like they need to establish a little bit there. Everson Wells, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you. Thank you, guys. For Nate appreciate Newton it. and Will Chambers, I'm Bobby Bell. Thank you so much for joining us tonight You're here. Bobby who? Uh, Bobby Bell. Okay. Uh, yeah. Not Bobby Bell. <laughs> yeah. On the SWBC <laughs> Dallas Cowboys Crosstalk. <laughs> has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?